Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Radically Open Dialectical Behavior Therapy for Eating Disorders, What Clinicians Need to Know. And today we're having a panel discussion with Drs. Thomas Lynch, Ellen Astrakhan Fletcher, Mima Simic, Ruli Hempel, and myself, Erica Smith Lynch. So we're going to begin with an introduction to using RODBT for clients with eating disorders, and Ruli and I are going to be presenting that. We're co-directors at Radically Open Limited, and we'll have a little bit more information on both of us uh, when we're joined by the rest of the panel in a few minutes' time. So what is Radically Open Dialectical Behavior Therapy? It's a trans transdiagnostic treatment that aims to treat maladaptive over-control. The treatment developer is Dr. Thomas Lynch. And RODBT is informed by dialectical philosophy, behavior therapy, mindfulness-based approaches, and Malamati Sufism. It's supported by 30 years of translational treatment development research and the feasibility, acceptability, and efficacy of RODBT are evidence-based. To date, more than 11 cl clinical trials have been published, including two RCTs and one multi-center RCT. Over 750 patients have received RODBT in research, and throughout the world, uh, more than 1,000 have been treated clinically. The outpatient RODBT treatment model includes individual treatment sessions and skills training classes, optional telephone coaching, and clinicians are strongly encouraged to meet regularly in consult teams. RODBT is a treatment for clients who suffer from maladaptive over-control. So what is over-control and how is it related to eating disorders? So maladaptive over-control is defined by four core deficits. What I'm going to do today is to talk you through the four core deficits, and alongside that, we're just going to have a look at how these can be seen in anorexia nervosa, which is a prototypical disorder of maladaptive overcontrol. So the first core deficit is receptivity and openness. This is manifested by high risk aversion, hypervigilance for threat, avoidance of novelty, and automatic discounting of critical feedback. And what we see in anorexia is that it has been found to be associated with low sensation seeking behavior, sensitivity to threat, and insensitivity to reward. And you'll see as we go through this slide that there's quite a few references and we will have a bibliography available for you at the end of our webinar today. The second core deficit is flexible responding. And this is manifested by compulsive needs for structure and order, hyperperfectionism, compulsive planning and rehearsal, rigid rule governed behavior, and moral certitude. And what we see in anorexia is that it's associated with perfectionism, cognitive rigidity, insistence on sameness, and strong personal needs for structure and symmetry. The third core deficit is emotional expression and awareness, manifested by inhibited expression, and or disingenuous expression, for example, smiling when distressed, and minimization or low self-awareness of distress. And anorexia is associated with inhibited emotional expression and impaired recognition of emotion in others. And the fourth core deficit is social connectedness and intimacy. This is manifested by aloof and distant relationships, high social comparison, envy and bitterness, and low empathy and validation skills. And anorexia is associated with aloof and distant relationships. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, individuals with eating disorders suffer from high levels of loneliness. So we're gonna hand over to Ruli, who's gonna talk about um, over control and other eating disorders. Ruli? Yeah. Okay, so we've... Um... So Eric explained how over-control and anorexia nervosa overlap. But what about over-control and other eating disorders? And um, for this, I'd like to uh, look at a, a study that was carried out by Isaacson et al. In, um, pu and published in 2021. 
where uh, they looked at over-controlled, under-controlled, and resilient personality styles among patients with eating disorders. And this actually goes back to Block and Block, who in 1980 identified three recurrent personality styles in different populations. The over-controlled style, characterized by high self-control, inhibitory control, and persistence, and low impulsiveness and emotional expression. The under-controlled, characterized by high levels of impulsivity and emotional expression with low levels of self-control and inhibition. And the resilient, characterized by an ability to modify the level of control, to have a change in demand in the environment. And you can see that represented in the graph um, that I put to, uh, next to the text. And um, and one, one thing to point out here, actually, is that the extremely under-controlled tribe type have low psychological well-being and the extremely over-controlled type also have low psychological well-being whereas the resilient types are expected to have better psychological well-being. Okay so um, Isaac and all asked groups of people to complete the ego under control scale and the ego resiliency scale and these groups based on the DSM-5 diagnosis were clients who had been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa restricting type anorexia nervosa binge eating purging type, atypical anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, borderline personality disorder, and uh, they included a non-clinical group. And so what they wanted to know is how these different groups scored on the um, ego under control and ego resiliency scales. So what they found is that the uh, anorexia nervosa restrictive type and the atypical anorexia nervosa groups showed the highest level of over control whereas the borderline group showed the highest level of under control and the bulimia nervosa and the um, normal control groups were at the same intermediate level there was no significant difference in over control when comparing the anorexia nervosa binge purge type group with the other eating disorder groups or with the uh, control group however this lack of statistical significance may have been due to the small sample sizes. Um, the graph suggests, if you look at it, that the uh, anorexia binge purge subtype also has higher levels of over control shown by the lower bars on the ego under control scale. And uh, no differences were found between the groups for ego resiliency. But don't forget that these results are based on means and standard deviations, not on individual clients. So um, we put um, a box plot here on the slide where the individual dots represent individual clients. And um, on the, you go under control scale, so their scores on this scale. And what you can see is the widespread of the dots along the vertical bar tells us, for example, that not all clients with anorexia nervosa are, are over controlled because some score quite high on under control. Not all clients with bulimia nervosa are under control. Some score quite high on over control. And so uh, the moral of this story is that over and under control are trans diagnostic and they're not limited to specific diagnoses. So each in individual client should be assessed for over control or under control to ensure that they receive the treatment that is right for them. And uh, the feasibility, acceptability, and efficacy of RDBT for eating disorders are evidence-based. And um, five clinical studies have been published to date that have investigated the effectiveness of RDBT for eating disorder in various age groups, eating disorder subtypes, and settings. For the age groups, these are adults and adolescents. The diagnostic groups, studies have included clients with anorexia nervosa and restrictive type, anorexia nervosa binge purge type, atypical anorexia, and other specified feeding and eating disorder. And the treatment setting has also varied from inpatient, outpatient, and intensive day treatments. Um, so here I'll give a brief summary of what these five uh, clinical studies have found so far. And if you want to know more, we will, uh, there is a separate webinar with uh, much more detail about each of these research studies and the outcomes. So the first study was carried out by Professor Lynch and colleagues in 2013 
And this was an inpatient setting and they had an adult sample. And what they found was significant and large effect size increases in body mass index, as large as um, effect size of 1.71, which is considered very large. Um, they also found large effect size improvements in eating disorder related psychopathology and psychological distress for treatment completers. Ah, we see that it was the largest effect size to date, in fact, for eating disorder studies with anorexia nervosa patients. Um, in 2015, Eunice Chan and colleague carried out a study, um, an outpatient adult sample with nine clients. And what they found is that intention to treat analysis showed significant increases in weight gain and menses resumption for 62% of the sample at the end of treatment. They also found large effect sizes for body mass index and medium effect sizes for eating disorder uh, psychopathology. In 2020, Bodynet et al. carried out a study in an outpatient adolescent sample where they found um, that 70.8% had a good to intermediate outcome on the Morgan Russell scale, and 4.6% did not respond. They were referred to inpatient treatments, but they found significant improvements in drive for thinness, depressive mood, social connectedness, and emotional expressiveness in these adolescents. Um, in 2021, Isaacson et al. published a study. This was using an outpatient adult sample. And what they found was that 8 out of 13 patients completed the treatment, and all of these completed were in full remission after treatment, with a BMI of over 18.5. And their eating disorder psychopathology was within one standard deviation of the community mean, meaning within the normal range. And finally, the fifth study was carried out also in 2021 by Bodinet et al. in an adolescent intensive day treatment program. And they found significant reductions in depression and eating disorder symptoms, both large effect sizes. And they also found significant improvements in cognitive flexibility, risk aversion, increased reward processing and reduced suppression of emotional expression. So uh, this is a, a quick summary. And as I said, if you want to know more, then um, we do a separate webinar on the research specifically. Okay, well, that was it for the introduction. And uh, now we're going to move to the panel discussion using RODBC for clients with eating disorders. Getting started. So why don't we move to uh, introduce the people that we're going to be talking to today. So first of all, sitting next to me is my husband and the treatment developer, Dr. Tom Lynch. Uh, Tom was the director of the Duke Cognitive Behavioral Research and Treatment Program in the USA from 1997 until 2007. And he's now Professor Emeritus of Clinical Psychology at the University of Southampton in the UK. And as I said, he's the treatment developer of RODBT. He's been a recipient of multiple research awards, including large clinical trial grants from NIMH and NIDA in the USA, and EMER, NIHR in the UK. Experimental research funding from NASAD, and is also a recipient of the John M. Rhodes Psychotherapy Research Endowment, a Beck Institute scholar, a grandfathered fellow in the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, and a fellow of the British Psychological Society. Woo! Plus, wow. Tom was also a senior trainer for standard DBT with BTEC. Goodness me. Oh, my. I know. Okay, so that's Tom. Okay, so I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So we'll go to Ellen next, Dr. Ellen Astrakhan Fletcher, who is a fellow of the Academy of Eating Disorders and a certified eating disorder specialist and supervisor. And Ellen is the regional cl clinical director, Midwest and East Eating Recovery Center and Path Like Mood and Anxiety Center. She has a wealth and breadth of experience treating adults and adolescents with mood, anxiety, and eating disorders. Ellen's a lecturer at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and an associate professor of clinical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Ellen's got over 30 years of clinical and teaching experience in the field of eating disorders and women's mental health issues, and is a co-author of the ORODBT workbook for eating disorders and the DBT skills workbook for bulimia. 
We've got Mima, Dr. Mima Simic, who's the joint head of the Maudsley Center for Child and Adolescent Eating Disorders. And uh, Mima is the consultant child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist at Maudsley and has been so for the last two decades. She doesn't look that old, does she? <laughs> Ooh, I would never say anything like that, no. A key focus of her research interest has been the development of psychological interventions for eating disorders and self-harm. Mima is a national and international trainer on treatment intervention, interventions and acts as a consultant on service development. Mima has been an active member of the executive board on the Faculty for Eating Disorders at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And both Mima and Ellen are senior RODBT clinicians, and Mima is a co-author of the RODBT workbook for eating disorders, alongside Ellen and Dr. Karen Hall, who sadly can't be with us today. Okay. And uh, I'm also going to introduce Ruli, Dr. Ruli Hempel, who's my co-director at Radically Open Limited. And Ruli and I uh, are responsible, responsible for the dissemination of um, RODBT in the clinical communities around the world. And Ruli also has the added experience of being the trial manager uh, for the uh, RCT trial that we did on depression, reframed. And uh, Ruli's been working alongside um, Tom for, I don't know how many years. years now, 15 years now, Ruli, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So experience. Okay. And uh, I, my experience is, um, as well as being the wife of Tom, is to, I work on the treatment development team, and my interests are kind of like uh, educating clinicians and hoping that we can get them up to be supervisors and trainers so that we can continue the dissemination around the world. So... And reading everything I write. And reading everything Tom writes, that's right, yeah, yeah. which is a job in itself. <laughs> Hence the glasses. Okay. All right, so should we move on to the first question? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a question and answer session, and uh, we're just going to get people to jump in and uh, answer um, according to how they think their experience fits with the question. Okay. Nicely done. All right, so let's go to our first question then. So is RDBT a treatment for any eating disorder, for example, AN, RFID, bulimia, and BED? And Ellen, I think that you're going to start with this one. And maybe you can just explain um, what the AN, RFID, and BED stands for as well, for those of us that aren't quite so familiar with it. Absolutely. Cool. So AN is anorexia nervosa, which is an eating disorder that is primarily of the restrictive type. Then there is bulimia nervosa, that's the BN, which tends to be a cycle of restriction, binging, and then purging. And then there is, so it involves compensatory behavior. Then there's binge eating disorder, which tends to involve often episodes of restriction and then binging, or just episodes of binging, eating large amounts of food in a short period of time. Um, and then there's ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which typically involves um, developed fears or aversions to eating that can be more sensory um, and more like related to maybe I, I vomited at some point and now I have a fear of vomiting, so I'm afraid of eating. So more of those types of things. Um, and so the question is, uh, what was the question again related to? Yeah. Is RODBT a treatment for any, any eating disorder? So it's funny when I think about that question, what I think is yes and no. Meaning RODBT isn't about treating the eating disorder. It's about treating what underlies potentially all of those eating disorders. And I have seen over control in all of those eating disorders, meaning anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and ARFID. Now, people typically think of it more connected to anorexia nervosa because, of course, you know, when you think about the self control one needs to have to not give in to our natural, not only urge and desire, but need to eat. Um, but it absolutely occurs in all eating disorders. Okay, Mima, do you want to add anything to that? 
Yes, I think that kind of the primary focus of treatment is the treatment over control and over control can be on the basis of an eating disorder. It's more often found in anorexia nervosa maybe than other disorders because the risk and predispositions for anorexia nervosa lie more frequently uh, uh, in people who develop anorexia nervosa. Okay. Yeah, and I think this is, um, you know, when you think, look back on when we, I was developing our ODBT and we were doing the initial research in eating disorders. For me, it was uh, choosing anorexia primarily because the data at that time was very clear that the phenotype, the, the behavioral aspects of how the, the, the client uh, behaved in, in the world, you might say, but also the, was so similar to what we'd think of as over-controlled. But, and that would it also include the overlap with diagnoses that, you know, we clearly identify as over-controlled, things like autism and, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but also um, really the biotemperamental basis of over-control is an important thing that we take into account. And that's the genetic and biological aspects of, of um, temperament, which influences how you perceive and how you regulate, how you manage yourself in the world. And anorexia is, you know, really uh, close to our biological anchor. You might think of it in that way when it comes to over-controlled uh, problems. Um, the only, the only um, you know, kind of diagnosis that we think might have quote unquote, a, a more severe biological basis would be autism spectrum. Uh, but right next to it is then anorexia. And then next to that is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So that's, that's how we kind of got into it. And then once we started to get into this, what I discovered in working with eating disorder experts over the years is that actually from their perspective, there was a lot of other problems that have eating disorders focus that over control was occurring, just like both Ellen and, and Mima have mentioned. So that's that's kind of how it got there, I guess. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to say the science is just confirming what Tom has said and how he developed the treatment because new studies have confirmed the genetic association between anorexia nervosa and OCD. So yes, uh, genetic, neurobiological, temperamental basis seems to be shared between different disorders. Yeah, it's okay, amazing. Cool, thank you. And although we're not going to talk about assessment now, I'm, I'm just kind of assuming, though, that what's important as you start to think about treating these clients with RODBT is that you assess for over-control as the underlying problem. Okay. And I do also want to point out, often within the field of eating disorders, people cross diagnoses, meaning someone can be anorexic at one point in their life and bulimic at another point in their life. But if they're OC, they're OC through both of those eating disorders. Yeah, cool. Thank and, you. And the reason we'd say that, you know, just to jump in again here, this discussion, I guess we're having fun here because um, thinking that the reason they remain OC is because of that biotemperament, right. the genetic aspect of the disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, so kind of cool, kind of interesting. Yeah. Me. I think it's important that we bring this up, that it can cross diagnosis and it is not just anorexia nervosa restricting type. Because so far, the, the, the five studies, pre-post studies that have been done for RDT for anorexia nervosa have almost all of them been for the restrictive type, some binge purge, and atypical anorexia nervosa. But um, so I was going to say, despite that, there's actually, it can, of control can occur in, in any kind of eating disorder. I think it's important that we realize that. Right. Okay. Thanks, Julie. And in fact, when we first thought about the book, it was brought up, should we write it just for yes. anorexia? And we all felt very strongly we wanted to include all eating disorders. Interesting. Right. 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 Good. Hey, okay. yeah. thanks. So should we move on to the next question? And I think uh, this is another one for Ellen to begin with. When is RO appropriate for those restricting food? For example, if someone is overweight but restricting and losing weight rapidly, can RO be used? Um, so my answer to this question honestly is going to relate to my answer to a lot of the questions that I've seen. Um, and the response is someone has to be medically stable, right? And so someone can be very overweight and lose weight rapidly and become very medically unstable. 
and they are not appropriate for RO when they're medically unstable. So, um, you know, I think that is a point I really want to make crystal clear, especially in an outpatient basis. You need a multidisciplinary team. If someone is doing any behaviors that might negatively impact their medical stability, okay. um, because that's not something that we monitor when we're doing our ODBT. Right. Okay. And I think we're going to come into a bit more detail about um, having multidisciplinary teams. Mima, do you want to add something to that? I just want to add that and we will talk about the multidisciplinary team and the role of people who have to make the treatment safe. Uh, and you have to have that people on the team. It doesn't have to be literally a team, but they have to have the access to physician uh, who can monitor uh, their physical state. Right. Okay. You okay with that? Tom? That sounds great. All right. Okay. So um, maybe the next question for us, really, which is at what point is RODBT most appropriate? For example, after family-based treatment is completed, parallel to FBT, if it's a different therapist. And Mima, how about you answer this? You're our family-based uh, therapist um, expert here. I have to say that we have a very specific treatment context. So family-based treatment as known in America has originated at the mostly hospital. Uh, and then in the last 10 years, we have revised the family therapy treatment. And included, interestingly enough, the biotemperament as the part of what we address in the treatment. And I have to say, and I will say over and over again, actually, when I went to first Tom's workshop, I was absolutely amazed how the treatment fits where our thinking was. So answer to this question is, as we learned RODBT, we moved the RODBT treatment earlier. But you have to have a confidence and experience what you can do in RODBT. For people who are not experienced, probably they will have to wait until the weight is stabilized to start the RODBT treatment if they are not able to address weight increase and weight gain within a RODBT treatment. I'm not saying that's a treatment target, but it can be conditioned to treatment. So in FBT, there are phases. Uh, in FTN that we are doing family therapy for anorexia nervosa the most, we have four phases. The first phase is engagement, and the second phase in FTN, which is the first phase in FBT, is about the weight gain. So people might want first to establish the trajectory of the weight gain, and then they don't have to complete FBT, but in the phase when we are working on individuation of the uh, patient, about their social connection, that might be the right timing actually to switch the treatment to RODBT. So you don't have to complete it. We, uh, we select the timing, we screen for over control. I have to say, we screen for over control first. And for young people that we see that before anorexia, there, was, uh, there were problems in their social connection, they were feeling lonely, they're feeling isolated, they're all possible triggers for relapse. So we'll start our DBT at the point when we want to work more individually with the, with young person. That sounds great. I, you know, I was thinking as I was listening here too, that uh, I'm curious about how both of you might take this comment on my part, but um, mm -hmm. It seems, you know, one of the things we did very early on is is to manage some of the, the medical concerns and, and the issues about, uh, you know, the health, the physical health of the patient. And I'm here talking about the anorexic patient. In our first study we did, which was an inpatient study at the Halden unit in the United Kingdom. And that, and they, so, and we there, because we had a full team and the whole team was trained in radically open DBT, meaning broadly yes. speaking, they knew the treatment. And so we we were able, though, then to start right from the beginning with the client, with RO. And the reason we felt confident doing that is because we had right on the unit, they were living there, 
an entire medical team, you know, with nurses and, and physicians and that type of thing, and uh, dietitians and nutritionists and all that type of thing. And so it, I guess it might be that depending on where you are working and what your setting is, it might also influence as to how you might then or how soon you might get RODBT into your program. And, I, and I'm curious about what you guys might do. Uh, and, and can I thank you for reminding me, Tom, because actually I was talking really about outpatient, our mm -hmm. outpatient program and when you're treating just the community. But we do have as a part of the service our day program that corresponds to PHP in America. And then RODBT is the main treatment in our day program because okay. they are a structure that allows weight gain. So a condition in being a PHP or kind of day program is that the, the, uh, the weight gain has been contracted. You don't have to address that in our role because it's already there. And then we do have a skills classes and we have three hours of skills classes every week because it's a 13 weeks day program. And that fits incredibly well. And those are very, very underweight people. We are right. talking really low BMIs. Yeah. Uh, and as they stay in the program, they're able more and more to access treatment, but the physical stability has been maintained by the structure of the program. Yeah, and that's what we found. At all. I mean, the average um, BMI was 14 for that study at baseline when they started, and then it ended at uh, 18 uh, yeah. or higher, I think, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So we did very well. We had a really large effect sizes there. But again, that kind of you had that confidence in of taking a client that's really um, you might be worried about, of course, on an outpatient basis. I think that's really a good point. Yeah. Helen, have you have you got something to add to all of that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this is one thing I was thinking, um, you know, missing Karen very much today, but also recognizing she really has the outpatient, outpatient experience. Mm -hmm. um, most of my experience is in higher levels of care. So residential, partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient programming. Um, and we absolutely introduce RO at the various, very highest levels of care. Um, uh, recognizing that the more malnourished a brain is, the more rigid a brain is. So that's why the material needs to be just gently introduced initially, and then we continue to reinforce it. Um, Juliana Gorder and I are also working on uh, creating a higher RODBT and higher levels of care um, kind of program and really addressing components like, you know, RO is most effective when a person self-identifies as over control and wants to do RODBT. And sometimes in higher levels of care, you don't always have that. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, figure out how can we make this work for people who do identify as OC and want RO, and then you can make it work beautifully. So we're really excited about that coming out as well. Yeah, so are we. I do have to say, because one of our pilot studies was done in a day program and we have given really good results. Uh, in our day program, mostly people are over-controlled uh, because they're mostly atypical anorexia. ARFID is the other one and kind of anorexia. And it, it's just the percentage of people with over-control is exceptionally high. Uh, and the results that are uh, of our pilot were really promising uh, and positive. And I have to say, the adolescent, this is the first treatment that adolescent would say, oh, this relates to me, adolescent with anorexia, this relates to me, this is kind of mm -hmm. the first uh, treatment that fits uh, and talks to me. That's great. Yeah, yeah, we hear that with adults as well. That's really, it's really good that adolescents feel that as well. I mean, it's it, really good. I didn't say this earlier, but it is one of the things we discovered early on it, as I was working with the anorexic patients um, that I, when I first started applying our LDBT with this, we started to talk with them about what it was like for them growing up. And as we started to assess them for over control and, and, you know, basically I could say almost all of them that were, you know, what leaned toward what we'd say over control is 
they all talked and agreed that they were kind of perfectionistic and socially anxious and, you know, uh, had difficulty fitting in with their peers and all those types of things that are part of over control. And that occurred for most of them around age four or five or six, something like that. And that's exactly what the data shows when you look at the large studies that look at, um, you know, things like over-controlled personality styles. It, it, it shows that these, these, these biotemperamental problems show up at around that age. And that's, so they would all sort of get that, yeah, I've been over-controlled all my life. And it wasn't until later in my life that I started to develop these symptoms and then got labeled as having an eating disorder. And one way to think about that is whatever they did with the eating disorder problem was one way of maybe perhaps coping with this difficulty of having a, a temperament that's biased toward being threat sensitive and detailed focused and in a way that's not always healthy. Um, and yet still having all this, you know, really excellent superior inhibitory controls. Mm -hmm. If you want to restrict food, you can do it, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, if you choose to. Right. And, and so, I don't know, it's just something like that has mm -hmm. been helpful for us. And I, I remember so many clients saying, yeah, this makes sense that we're targeting over control because it's something that I've had all my life and nobody's ever talked to me about mm. it. Yeah. This perfectionistic mm. style that I have, this way of being. Yeah. Well, and, and I would add another thing that I often hear people really connecting to is that sense of emotional loneliness. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and this is one of the things that I sometimes talk to, to patients about, especially in higher levels of care. We know that people come in and out of higher levels of care multiple times before they recover. That's shown in, you know, across the board with eating disorders. Um, and one of the hypotheses about that is that basically they come in when they are typically a person in the outside world who is never vulnerable, who really isolates a lot, is more comfortable alone, and they come into a setting where the rules are you're vulnerable and you share yourself and others share and they connect and that that's part of what helps them recover. But because we've never taught them how to connect outside they go back to their outside world where it's lonely and isolated and they take. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think RO, and when I explain that to people, they're like, oh my gosh, you're so right. Mm -hmm. um, it really has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. It's kind of like we give an instruction manual that they can take out with them from out from the intensive treatment right. program mm -hmm. on how to get along with others, how to make friends, how to actually connect with mm -hmm. others. And they've got a manual almost, and, and it teaches them exactly the step-by-step -step things that you need to do to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to work. Mima, I know you, you want to say something. I just wanted to say, I think we started with FBT. I don't want people who are listening that we are answering FBT and uh, uh, ROZBT. So I just want to say what we are saying in family-based day programs, it can start from the beginning. You, you can have it as a part because some of PHPs in America are family-based. So this is really something that can be done concurrently in parallel from the beginning. In the communities, people have to have a weight gain and to be medically stable and then think how the weight gain, even if it's not achieved, will continue during our DBT. Because just want to be, for anorexia nervosa, there is no recovery of weight gain. So we cannot lose that as a condition, one of the conditions for recovery. Right. Okay. Thank you for bringing us back there. That was, that was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mima. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I think what's, uh, what's interesting is the next question is kind of related to what we've just been talking about because um, we've been talking about having a, a medical team and that kind of stuff. So uh, what recommendations, if any, would RODBT make with respect to the level of training and experience in eating disorders an RO therapist might need when working with clients struggling with ED? So uh, Ellen, Mima, do you want to jump in on that? 
I can jump in. I would say you have to have experience in eating disorder because it's specific. Uh, uh, kind of, you have to have both. Uh, I I think that what we've done, we had the eating disorder experience, and then Tom came and trained the whole team. I think it's probably the best approach if people can have that teams are trained. But at the same time, you just have to have experience in eating disorder first, not because you have to know something about the risks. You cannot go without it. You have to know something. You have to know a lot about the eating disorder, but that is not at the expense of not being trained in our model simultaneously or right. in sequence. Right. So, okay. My answer is you have to have it. Right. Thank you. That's important. I'm going to come back to that. Ellen, okay. is there anything that you want to add to that? I mean, I would agree. And part of the reason I was, you know, kind of dodging the question is because I read the question as like, how much? Um, and I don't, I don't know how to answer that part of the question. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with Mima that some knowledge of eating disorders is crucial um, because there are, you know, components of the disease that I think can be really misunderstood if people don't right. okay. have experience. And, and I, I just want to make a point that I, I'm really glad that both of you have said that because we've had some feedback that apparently some people, and we don't know who this is, but some people are saying that if you know RODBT, you can go and treat eating disorders without having any experience of eating disorders. And I really want to make that clear. That is not something that we support and it is not something that we say. And I really want to make that very clear. Tom, do you want to add something I mean, to that? I, I agree with this whole discussion. I think that um, it's, it's, it's basically like, you know, if you're going to treat suicide, you need to know about how to treat suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, RODBT has suicide protocols, how to manage it very specifically, but it doesn't cover everything. And so anytime there's a kind of special population or special issue for, and in this case, we're talking about concerns with uh, life-threatening issues, we could say. And so to like suicide, it's the same kind of thing. You would want to get, you know, as a clinician, you want to make sure you feel pretty grounded in that in a broad way. And um, so at the very least, the way I would think about it, like if I was an outpatient person and I say I wanted to treat eating disorders, I didn't really have much experience. I mean, at the very first, I'd, I'd have to find a colleague who somewhere, somehow, I'd have to figure out a way of getting in touch with someone that was really a bona fide expert in the eating disorder area and find a way to get consultation at the very least or from them, first of all, to help me even understand what courses I might need to take if I needed any or what things I needed or what I needed to do to get to myself to a place where I'd have some comfort. But I'll tell you this much, if I'm not that experienced in it, at least my way of thinking about running a clinic from an outpatient perspective, I would want to have an outside consultant who I can get some sort of contact with probably on a weekly basis at the very least it would seem, um, which I could, you know, be flexible depending on, on as I grow in my own understanding and those types of things, mm -hmm. but someone available. So when I have a, something going on and I'm not sure exactly how to handle it, I can go and get some supervision essentially and those types of things. So I, I guess I agree that it, it's absolutely necessary to have that background and again, I, mean, I guess I'm thinking about for those clinicians that might be listening who are interested in learning, who they already know RODBT and now I'm thinking maybe they could apply it to eating disorders. I guess I'm, I'm looking for Ellen and Mima to see if we would agree that maybe if you're going to do it that way, instead of starting with a grounding of eating disorder, then learn RODBT, if you've come into it uh, in the other way, is my idea of basically you have to start somewhere where you get someone that you, you know is going to be able to kind of guide you to where you need to get educated with eating disorders. Because I, I don't think there's a, an actual program you can take at a university on it, per se. It's something you have to do in a, in a different way. Is that How does that make sense for you guys? Um, I have to say in UK, we do have a trainings in eating disorders. You That's know, great. there are like kind of eight days kind of oh, training. So, so uh, there is like a basic eating disorder training 
for the child and adolescent eating disorder services. I think it's we work in a multidisciplinary teams in UK, so you always save. I think in our models, we were always saying if you have expertise within a team, then it's okay that a person can learn if they're surrounded with others who have that expertise. Right. Uh, I think it's hard to work on its own. Uh, so having a consultation, but you have then to have regular supervision and consultation because it goes two ways. One is that you might miss the physical risk or underestimate the physical risk. The other is that the therapy gets overwhelmed with the risk and unknown. So it, it will impact their ability as a therapist when they should, what they should target. So it, you have to have a system or uh, how you, if you are on your own as a therapist, where your consultation and supervision is coming from. And if you don't have expertise, who is going to supervise you or who you are consulting regarding the eating disorder bit? Mm -hmm. uh, if there are no specific, I'm talking short-term eating disorder trainings at least to get the grounding, uh, yeah. some grounding. Do they, so exist, do they exist in the US, Ellen? Yeah, so what I heard Tom asking was, um, you know, or suggesting was getting a consultant who is somewhat of an expert in the field of eating disorders, mm -hmm. who could then recommend what types of trainings they might want to pursue. Right. And that I agree with, because for example, if someone comes to consult with me, I would send them in certain directions. Like for example, the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, that's my CEDSS. So people can become certified eating disorder specialists. I'm a supervisor of the certified eating disorder specialist. So there's all kinds of coursework. They have to do case studies. I mean, if you have someone who has, you know, who's learning RO and wants to learn more about eating disorders, they can just go to that conference and learn tons. Right. over the course of several days. Right. And, and I guess I also think maybe it's important to just mention that um, when RLDBT clearly makes it very clear that the practitioner of RLDBT needs to have someone either on their team or is they've got available on, in, you know, in whatever way needs to be done, who is who's going to manage the physical well-being of the client. And we like to separate the two so that the therapist can focus on the interpersonal issues and the social signaling kind of problems that we target in treatment and, um, and, and that type of thing and are overwhelmed with having to manage the other aspect. But it's really important, we, I guess, just mention that again, because mm -hmm. I'm more imagine people might know that already, but yeah. You know, this is kind of. What it's I just want to add that my understanding of FBT in America, and you correct me, Alan, you will know more about that. That is not uh, unusual for FBT therapists that there is a physician or pediatrician uh, involved in care or nutritionist. Uh, they should. Well, your point was, Mima, that the model is already set up with yeah. uh, FBT, so what? So a therapist. Can yeah. take the same kind of notion, and that's that's kind of what we're saying, isn't it? We're saying yeah, that's like, what we're saying. Someone that's going to manage that that yeah. physical well-being of the client, yeah. so that you can then take care of other things. Yeah, exactly. And and that's just so important that we emphasize that. Yeah. yeah. So I guess broadly speaking, I guess we're saying no, you don't want to just go and do RODBT without having some eating disorder, special you know knowledge yourself as the therapist but also having someone that's really managing that physical well-being. Ideally, yeah. you know, they can be a separate person. That's that's what we're talking about. But I it, think the, the, the whole question about it's not our DBT therapist who is managing the physical risk. In our service, it's not the our DBT therapist who manages the physical risk, but there is a person whose role is uh, that uh, to manage physical risk and to know if there is a risk, what to do. You can't expect our, our DVT therapist to do that. That That's, that's yeah, right. Is, Ellen, it looks like you're saying you go along with that too. Oh, yeah. I think for an RODBT therapist to do that without a medical degree would be unethical. So <laughs> absolutely, 100%. Right. And, and, and really, though, think about it. 
even if they did have a medical degree and did have the appropriate training, if I was that person and I wanted to use RLDBT in the way it's designed to be used, I still would want to get a colleague of mine to manage the physical parts of the, the problem so I wouldn't have to do the same thing, you know, with, you know, have to have a double dip, you might say, have to do both dual jobs. Role. Yeah, dual role. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mima's so, got to come. I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a medic. But I will never manage the medical risk of uh, uh, young people that I see as our, our David th therapist. Great. That's a yeah. really Thank you. strength is that exactly what we're it. saying, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to jump. There's a, there's a question because I've got a list of questions here. I'm just going to jump down a bit because I think this might follow on. Um, so, so how would medical stability and imminent risk, for example, bradycardia, electrolyte imbalances, arith uh, arrhythmias, arrhythmias, arrhythmias yes. um, be assessed and managed by the therapist in the RODBT model with and without a team? It wouldn't. <laughs> Good answer. That's my answer. Yeah. Absolutely. It wouldn't and it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It really shouldn't. I think if you have uh, somebody with this level of symptoms, then uh, definitely physicians should be already involved in the care of this patient and monitoring that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so that our DB therapist should offer treatment without a physician with the patient who has any of these symptoms. Okay, great. You've made that really clear. Is that okay, sweetheart? Do you want mm, to do anything No, it's good. Else? I think uh, okay. yeah, I'll let that be. All right. So, and if a client, maybe really we'll just go on to the one following that question. If a client were to become medically unstable during the course of treatment, how would an RO clinician manage that? Shall I take that, Mimi? You want me to jump with that one? Yeah. Um, so if I was informed by the medical part of the team that the patient was becoming medically unstable, the agenda, you know, RO drops. I mean, and that's, you know, I also think about non-suicidal self-injury in a similar fashion. Again, I work in higher levels of care. Often patients have severe eating disorders and non-suicidal self-injury. Um, and when they want to do RO, the individual work with me, um, I make it really clear they can use their superior inhibitory control not to use their non-suicidal self-injury, or we can't make much more progress in RO. Um, it is, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly they can stop using their non-suicidal self-injury in order to get RO DBT. Um, and I look at medical instability in the same way. You are showing us that you are not ready for the work in RODBT if you, you know, can't take care of yourself to a place of medical stability. Right. Yeah. I, I'll jump in and just say that though it, there is in, in, in the treatment manual, it clearly talks about this issue, essentially kind of I'm going along with what Ellen was talking about here that basically the idea when it comes to eating disorder problems or any kind of life-threatening problem, if it becomes imminent and let's now stick with eating disorders, then if I get alerted to that, then I drop all my social signaling targets. I'm not focused on that. Uh, I mean, it's not that I completely forget them, but I am going to now spend the majority of my time focused now on um, taking care of that life-threatening issue. In this case, it'd be the eating disorder thing. And that would mean probably then starting to monitor things in a different way and working very closely with the person that's my medical consultant to make sure that I'm kind of, you know, tracking things properly and doing, but it, it just changes the focus of treatment. Um, and you're talking there about the treatment hierarchy, aren't you? Exactly. Right. So it's life-threatening and then mm -hmm. therapeutic, um, therapeutic alliance ruptures. Yeah. And then, um, we've got this, the social signaling targets that we do as the third part of that hierarchy. Yeah. Right. Good. Okay. So um, following on from that, really the next question that we've got uh, is, can a medically unstable client begin RO treatment on an outpatient basis? Are there clients that you would say are not stable enough to begin RO treatment? And if there are, what, would that, what might that criteria be? Now, I think we've kind of answered it, but it would be good to summarize sort of the answer in relation to this particular question. Again, I don't work outpatient, but I 
would say no if they're not medically stable how, how can you move forward with social signaling focus right Mima I would agree with that uh, uh, I, I don't think the people should work in a long patient basis with medically unstable uh, 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 clients right and there is a question about the criteria. Would either of you have a sense about what would be the things that would tell you this person, because I'm treating them on an outpatient basis and because of their particular issues with their medical stability, this is this is what would tell me I'm, I'm just not going to be able to work with them in, in an RO perspective. Can I just say, uh, can the, we do have a guidance uh, in Britain what uh, constitutes medical instability, but it is only the doctor, the physician, who can rate if somebody is medically unstable or not. I don't see how our DBT therapists can determine, even using the criteria that are totally physical, if somebody is unstable or not. Okay, so that's the answer. In other words, there are criteria. Yeah. It would be up to the medical provider that you're consulting yeah. with to make that decision, which is exactly fits, by the way, so everyone knows that's listening, that is the RODBT model when it comes to these types of issues. So, I mean, it's right in, in, in with it. But I, I wanted to make sure we didn't lose that one part Yeah. because it was a specific question about criteria, yeah. and I thought, uh, well done, nicely answered. Yeah. Ellen, anything to add? Yeah, all I was going to say is the only criteria for me is that a physician has said they're medically stable. <laughs> so, right. Yes. I, I yeah. love it. This is great. Right. Well, that was simple. Yeah. That okay. Was. Well, and we kind of moved towards that, didn't we, as we as we went through yeah. the questions. So, uh, Ruli, I'm going to go a little a bit further back up now to the question, how is the family involved in the RODBT model? And for the younger client, is the family encouraged to help with nutritional rehabilitation. And uh, Mima, maybe we can start with you. Uh, yes. Uh, can I start with the second part of the question and I'll come to the first part of the question. Uh, I'm coming from the certain context of the Mosley Hospital and in our context, and I think all over the world, the family, FBT, family therapy for anorexia nervosa is a first line treatment for young people under the age of 18. Uh, so in our model, family is always involved from the beginning, assessment is with the family, and from then onwards, family is the part of treatment. So in our context, family is always at the beginning involved in helping, supporting young people uh, during mealtime. Uh, the part of the treatment is also that there is a point when the family is going to step back and the young person, that's the part of recovery, will take on uh, eating by themselves. Uh, so I do think if you want efficient weight gain or kind of the most evidence is that for family support, uh, in the first phases of treatment. In the later phases of treatment, a uh, young person will start eating by themselves. That's a separate to family involvement in our DBT. I wanted to separate two things because family involvement in our DBT is something different. Uh, it can vary. It depends on the context. Because in our context, family is very involved in the first stages of treatment when you need to achieve weight gain. I'm talking about restrictive disorders. I'm not talking about other eating disorders. At the point of our DBT, we actually want to give more space to young person and family steps back. We give them information about our DBT and this is really important we will have maybe one or two groups. Uh, we also might do one group with young people together when they explain to the parents our DBT and show them a few skills. This is very deliberate because in our first phase of treatment, parents were very involved in supervision. So our experience was that in our DBT, they were over involved in asking people to do skills. Uh, and um, 
young people felt that was intrusive and not to their own. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm going to repeat that because over involved. That's a I've heard you talk about this before. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of as you and I have discussed, many yeah. of the families have lean toward over control themselves as a family or a perfectionistic yeah. family, not all of them, but it makes, so they actually carry that with them in terms of they, they now know their child's learned skills and then they start kind of writing them about it, like constantly. Yeah. It's a yeah. skill, it's a skill. Are you using, are you I, using, yeah. I think that's really important uh, what you're talking about that, yeah. However, I do think that our DBT uh, can be, if I was, in another service, I would really experiment with working together with families, with the parents and young people, but then also asking parents to use skills. I can imagine a context where you want to work together with families and with young people or have some groups together where because of the level of control in parents, I'm always enticed that we are missing. We just don't have enough resources and time. I would love to do some group with parents, but then really trying to screen and tackle their over control. So they, to help them, that they starting using skills. Absolutely. And yeah, I think and it's a lovely thing to develop. Uh, it's actually in the process of being developed. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Karen? That's yeah, Karen's there? starting to work so on So Karen, that, yeah. who was going to be was supposed to be with us on this call today, is yeah. working with me and uh, whoever else she has, and Heidi. And, and yeah. so you, you guys will probably be involved at some point in terms of consulting. Yeah. But we're working on this family-based uh, approach that's going to be teaching basically the family RODBT skills. Um, not all of them, of course, but um, that type of thing. Yeah. So it's, and it's been fun to, to do that. Um, so it's kind of exciting. And Ellen, you, did you have something else? Can you tell? Can you I tell? <laughs> um, one of the things that I do, you know, and I'm being playful because I'm under controlled, um, is that uh, I find it helpful to talk to families about the differences between over control and under control um, and how that can impact a family um, and ways that you might not even recognize is just about the fact that you process info differently. So for example, I will often tell the story about how my mother's over controlled and I'm under controlled. And then I'll say to them, what do you think it's like for my mother when she comes to my house? And that's literally all I have to say. And it's really funny because, you know, you can immediately see the family members that are over controlled and the family members that are under controlled. Right. And the over controlled will be like, oh, my gosh, it's probably overwhelming for her. Right. And the under controlled immediately recognize, oh, yeah, she probably criticizes you constantly. Right. Um, and, and I explain the fact that she and I now understand our biotemperamental differences. So she can come over to my house and she can tell me the top three things she sees. Five, <laughs> if it's a really bad day. <laughs> and I promise if she does that, if she keeps it to a limit, I promise to believe that she truly loves me, believes I'm a wonderful person, oh, oh, and is cool. just telling me this because she loves me and worries. Yeah, yeah. that's really nice. nice. Yeah. I think that's what's really great about um, knowing and owning your style and coming to love your style. And then really appreciating the differences. It's like Tom leans towards under control and I lean towards over control. And I, like he just brings so much to my life through his under control. And I'm really grateful for it. Um, so I, I love your story, Ellen. That was, that yeah, was really cool. That's yeah. nice. And, and I was thinking that, um, you know, going now back to what Mima said about young people and working with families and how important that is. And, and it makes so much sense from an RODBT um theoretical perspective because the if you're you know if you're not an adult yet your primary you probably your primary tribe you might say is your family assuming you're living with uh, your the, the family you, that you were born into and that type of thing or you have a family and it just makes so much sense to work um there but then once you get to be an adult part of the job that we have as our odbt therapists is to help our adult clients recognize that the 
kind of the task, the developmental task that they have in front of them is to form a tribe outside of their their family that they grew up in, you might say. And that's kind of what, you know, is part of becoming mature, you might say, in some ways, and, and, and that type of thing. So everything shifts, you know, depending on whether, what the age of the client in some ways, which I kind of find interesting. But yes, it was so important to have family. And, you know, when we did um, the latest, the large multi-center RCT we did, now in this case, looking at chronic depression, we had within it, of course, a, a, a thing where the, you know, the therapist could bring in the family as needed too. And so, or the, or the, you know, say if it's a couple relationship, their partner, and it, it's just important to mention that, that, you know, our ODBT would encourage that. And then what do you do? Well, essentially you're going to educate. I feel like what Ellen said, you know, you know, teach them some about over control and under control, some of the bio temperament things. You'll teach them some about, you know, what we're doing in treatment. And, and then the good news is there's all these manuals that we're working on to try to help, people get even, you know, more specific about what to do. So there's another book that's being worked on that I'm doing with um, Michael Masler, mm -hmm. which is um, looking at couples. Um, and that, I think Karen's on that too. Um, couples um, treatment from an RODBT perspective. And, and I suspect that, you know, who knows what will come from that, but yeah. it's, it's kind of fun. Anyway, I, I think this has been a good discussion. Yeah, me too. Well, and just one more thing to add, sometimes, and, and we talk about this in RO skills um, with the adolescents in particular, sometimes they'll see a dynamic where they have an over-controlled parent and an under-controlled parent. And they often describe the over-controlled parent being hypercritical of the under-controlled parent, mm -hmm. which conveys a lot of messages to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that does end up becoming an important part of the family work. Right. Yeah. yeah good point. Ellen. Makes sense. Good point. Anything else, Mima, from your perspective on this? I was, can you, I, I, Alan, I do see many more. I, I do think that complementary works, but mm -hmm. often there is two over control parents also. Oh, for um, sure. Uh, yes. Um, Double one. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I really, uh, I would say, I would love also to work with the parents in that way that uh, they also accumulate some skills. Uh, I would love to teach them some skills. Again, do you integrate food exposures in general? And if so, how? And what about with, I think it should be AFID in particular. Is there a, have you got a second question? Yeah. I'm just thinking this is a very CBTR fit food exposure approach. We do have a separate team and we do have some young people in our day program uh, uh, with, uh, that are receiving our DBT, uh, but we don't do food exposure as such. It's not, I'm not an expert on food exposure. Um, people who are in treatment with us, they just have to eat. Uh, and they have to eat what we put on the meal plan. Uh, so I don't call that the food exposure and not in the way that some people with RFID would if they're expanding the variety of food, which I think this question is related to. Okay. Ellen, how about you? Yeah. Um, so for RFID, for sure, that is part of the treatment protocol to do food exposures. So that's a pretty consistent, regular thing with the hierarchy and all of that. Um, and, you know, this is in higher levels of care, so they're getting multiple things. So when they have RFID, they do get food exposures. Other than ARFID, you know, I would say some of our patients would say surprise snack day is a food exposure <laughs> or surprise dessert is a food exposure. Um, you know, you can see some huge, huge fixed mind reactions in response to a cupcake. Um, so, you know, and that can be dealt with in a variety of ways. So. Right. Yeah, and I think that another thing that is part of this and it's not, you know, depending on how a person defines exposure, you know, they're using a behavioral terminology with that. What are they, how are they defining it? But, you know, broadly speaking, if we just step back and look at what that's about, it's in this case, you know, broadly speaking, is, is having someone that has a feared substance. In this case, the fear is this food in some way or another. It's, it's, it triggers all kinds of things in the client. And I think one thing might be said that RODBT has 
kind of a, a relaxed attitude about the whole process of food itself or whatever, because it turns out it just happens to be something they're going to have to deal with, whether yeah. they like it or not. Uh, it's part of being a, a living organism. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we'll use metaphor sometimes things of, um, you know, this, it's like taking your medicine. You may not like it, but it just turns out that you have to do it whether you like it or not. And that's part of, you know, being what's called a living organism. Otherwise, you're kind of dead. And, you know, you've told me that you're not going to want to die. So therefore, this turns out to be something you have to do. And I think so. And, and I know that, you know, Mima, there were times I, I would kind of encourage the eating disorder uh, therapist I was training at Maudsley when I was first working there and things to be have a, a sense of uh, playfulness about it on some level, to use what we call therapeutic teasing at times, to not be afraid to talk about eating or, or to, and just to not treat it yourself as dangerous because the mm -hmm. client is doing that and whether they like it or not they're going to have to be around food the rest of their life in some way or another and it's sort of helping them recognize that whether you know this is part of what happens when you're a living organism and that type of thing so it's that it's kind of an attitude i think we encourage in the therapist to take toward the whole issue mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, we do treat food as medicine I kind of that's our approach for this medicine you have to deal with it uh, and kind of any food if somebody who's severely anorexic is going to trigger fear uh, but that doesn't mean they they have to face it and people have to eat in order to survive yeah Excellent. and in fact there's actually things that we developed that uh, originally uh, came from you know as I was reading the literature early in the days and, I'm, you know, the, the way they train jet fighter pilots to not throw up when they're flying at high altitudes because you can get really nauseous and things. And they basically, without using those words, they're teaching them a, a kind of a mindfulness approach called urge surfing. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example of, you know, helping the clients that are anorexic or having problems with these issues with, you know, food and, and feeling bloated or, or that type of thing to start to see. To, we teach them, tech, you know, ways of stepping back and, and, you know, seeing it as a sensation, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything other than it's a, it's a sensation they're experiencing. And that's how they teach jet fighter pilots, too. And so, you know, part of what we try to is normalize it for our clients, too, that it's not like a big deal. People around the world have learned to do these skills themselves for other reasons. And it turns out you can do it as well, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it's it's actually kind of a fun thing to do. And I and I'm we're imagining maybe over the years we'll get even you know more creative and do all kinds of things with it. Well, I think urge surfing is my favorite. Uh, 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 what I teach, uh, and kind of I we do teach across uh, different eating disorders urge surfing because it's kind of really important uh, for people who are purging, doing compensatory behaviors as much as restriction. Uh, people who are restricting, absolutely. That's we do a lot of emphasis on urge surfing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I'll also add that sometimes I've seen people who don't necessarily know RO very well be uncomfortable about reading that passage to mm -hmm. patients because of, I think, what you know, a, a habit of fragilizing patients mm -hmm. um, and being concerned that reading about the fire, fighter pilots will trigger them. Um, oh, and, oh and, when people have that concern, I am just aware that they don't really understand RO and the principles and theory yeah. behind it. So. I mean, it I, a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mima. No, I just want to out myself, Tom, that kind of, uh, kind of about fragilizing and how much we were fragilizing uh, young people. Then when you introduce all the concept of working with envy and all these difficult emotions, I honestly was thinking that I cannot even say the word envy and that the young people will fall to pieces if I say envy. And that is the easiest thing that young uh, people can uh, hear they can use the word uh, they can talk about it with no issue it's actually really important in the field of eating disorder the whole social comparison envy issue and that was a little revelation <laughs> yeah and revelation how we fragilize uh, and and by the way, I, I will sometimes in skills class when it comes up in an appropriate way, will talk with patients about how they unintentionally contribute to getting their clinicians to fragilize them. Absolutely. Um, 
with it's their social. Don't hurt me sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. and, and, and they'll look at me and be like, I feel so called out. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then I just say to them, so I guess it's kind of up to you. Do you want to be fragilized? Is it within your values? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I do think it's important because I was on a, uh, an eating disorder panel years ago where we were talking about some issues around this. It was a mindfulness-based kind of panel. And there were some studies being presented about teaching people how to eat and enjoy the food, and it just didn't work. And, and I, I kind of knew that already, I guess, as the person that had developed our ODBT, because that's not the approach. We're not trying to get the, the patients to enjoy the food, per se. We're helping them learn to um, recognize that whether they like it or not, they're going to have to do it. And this is a way to do it in a way that kind of is palpable. It, it kind of works. Um, I've seen patients who won't it. eat because they enjoy the food. Because what? Because they enjoy because it. Because they enjoy it. Well, that's fascinating. It's so that's what I love. All the eating disorder stuff, there's all kinds of things like this. Yeah. <laughs> I, love I think this was a good discussion. It was right? a really good discussion, but I'm going to move us on okay. because um, I'm just aware of the time. Okay. So uh, the next question is, how is trauma addressed for the EDOC client? Do you want to take that one, Tom? Well, I mean, I'll just talk about it in general when we think about trauma. Um, I mean, there's, of course, if... If, you, if there's some sense that the trauma is such that it needs to be the primary focus of treatment, it's actually interfering with the client being able to attend to, um, you know, discussing anything else but the trauma, you know, you might say it's that powerful of a, a problem, then there's, you know, you could just do behavioral exposure treatments for trauma and get them sort of ready to move into doing our ODBT. However, and I'm going to do a talk about this this summer at the conference. Um, you know, our ODBT's approach is uh, also is is able and, and willing to look at trauma with our clients, but we do it a little differently. We think of it as grief work and helping the client, and we normalize it. We don't see it. trauma is something we've all had bad things happen to us, and we're going to have them occur in the future. And so, part of the process of learning to deal with these things in our lives is to understand how to grieve. And so we teach our clients how to grieve. And that's really, when you think about it, is what trauma-based coaches are doing on some level or another. And so we take it from that perspective. And from that way of thinking of it, we actually do many exposure. We do brief exposures to the trauma-based uh, experience and then regulate and then move to other things. But um, that would be a whole lecture. I'm giving it this summer, actually. Yeah. Um, and um, but and it is we'll it making, is interesting that we'll we have that. And we'll be making a of... webinar on it too. Oh, okay. To add to the yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. So should we move on, or is there anything that you two would like to add to that? No. no. I love that. I can't no. wait to no. see. Yeah. It. Okay. All right. yeah. okay. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, um, how are weight changes for the AN client? For example, weight loss or unchanged weight targeted and addressed in the model. Okay, Ellen, how about you start us off with that one? <laughs> um, I'm aware of imagining this might not surprise you, but uh, I'm going to have to be notified about it. So it's not something that I'm monitoring. So if someone else on the treatment team notifies me um, that the patient has lost weight, uh, then I bring it in initially as a social signal. Um, honestly, <laughs> it's, you know, what are you, you know, I, I've heard that, that um, I understand that you've lost some weight, that, you know, your team and I have been discussing this and there are some concerns. And um, I'm wondering what your perspective is on it, truly, no. especially, you know, in regards to your engagement and treatment and what's going on. Um, so I might kind of look at it like that initially, but ultimately if the rest of the team has decided, you know, again, at this point, if they lose this much weight, then we need to shift what we're doing. I'm going to support that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mima, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I'm also not monitoring the weight uh, as a therapist. It, uh, it's uh, usually by 
the FBT therapist previous. Uh, if there is a wage change, I will ask the therapist to see the family again, and that will be addressed to mobilizing the family again, but will be addressed in the individual session, what does this mean for treatment? And uh, what kind of social signal that is, and is there a, a rupture uh, in, and how the person is working towards the goals, uh, and uh, how is that linked with their values? So well, I mean, yeah, address all in 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 the individually. Right. Yeah, I mean, because it is absolutely true. That you think about it. If you've if you're under if you're losing weight. Yeah. And then if you start to look emaciated, yeah. you know, it's really a social signal to your tribe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. the question really, uh, when I have a social signaling perspective, what are you trying to tell your tribe? And is it something that you actually value that you think is, um, is this how you want to be perceived? Mm -hmm. Because when someone looks like this, how, what might other people think about them? What, so what is it that you're telling them, whether you like it or not, you are saying something. And that's just true for anything that we do that's a social signal, which is any behavior that's done in front of another human. Mm -hmm. And that goes with dress or anything that, that a person does. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's what I like about this approach. When it, that, so when we talk about it from a social signaling perspective, we're helping the client step back and look at, you know, what am I saying when I do this? Is this how I want to live? Is this what I want? You know, those kind of things often signal that you're incompetent or, or aren't managing your life very well. And it's uh, the question for the client is, is that how you want to be perceived? Is that how you want to live? And, and that's kind of, I think what I'm hearing from both of you is you're, you're drilling down and helping the client recognize that. And at the same time, which I love dialectics, you're also mm -hmm. having that outside team help you recognize when it's, you know, mm -hmm. needs to be focused on, you know, in a, maybe a little different way where it's actually, um, you know, the expectations change from that perspective where it's kind of a, an inquiry perspective mm -hmm. to something more mm -hmm. that's hands-on, um, right. I guess that's what I'm hearing. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And we can also talk about weight as feedback because it is feedback, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're gaining weight, that's feedback about what's happening. If you're losing weight, that's feedback. Um, and talking to patients about this, and this is something that's recently come up on the listserv as well, right? Which is, how do people navigate that? In FBT, they've always known their weight, but in lots of other treatments, that's something that typically people view as dangerous to share patients' weights with them. Mm -hmm. can, can I just say the FTN, we not always, uh, we agree with the patient or they want to know weight or they don't want to wait and we just inform if they're losing weight. Uh, I think the treatment is too much preoccupied with weight, so we are flexible about that. And what we learned over years, there can be flexibility. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And That's Eleanor, I, I liked your answer that you gave um, on our listserv where uh, there was a question, should we be telling the client their weight or not? Can you just give us a very quick uh, resume of what it was that you wrote? Well, I mean, it was it was a very long and there were <laughs> lots of components. I think the piece about the feedback being important in that patients often misinterpret the feedback though, or do things with that feedback. Right. I really like Mima that you asked the patients because in my experience, if a patient wants to know their weight, they're gonna find it out. And oftentimes, especially when they lean towards being over controlled, they will find out their weight purposefully to punish themselves to push them back to restricting, or at times they will find out accidentally at a doctor's office and then use that to justify slipping back to their eating disorder because they feel betrayed yeah. because they found out their weight in a different way. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of components in the yeah. way that we- yeah. What I'm hearing though is kind of reflects this notion, and this is very RODBT, to start with the client. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. say, yeah. you know, your life, how yeah. do you want to know? It turns out we know your way. Do you, do you want to know it or not? And right. and then my also my question might be, is it going to be useful to, you know, if you do want to know it, what how how you know what's going to happen if you know it? Can you predict mm -hmm. what will occur? What are the things that are there any problems with it? Help them make a decision about how they want to manage this mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing. Yeah. I, I really like that. Yeah. You know. Okay. And by the way, if they're worried about what the result might be, who might be someone they turn to for support? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so Ruli, I'm going to go into the next question. 
does RODBT require that ED psychoeducation be shared with the client? For example, neurobiological causes and maintaining factors, genetic differences in metabolism, sensory and perceptual differences. Okay, who's going to take that one? Uh, I just want to say, for me, uh, giving psychoeducation about over control is giving psychoeducation that is behind the eating disorder. For me, it's the same thing. So mm. we do a lot of psychoeducation. We talk about their temperament. We talk with families, with parents, with young people, uh, and they relate to that. Uh, that's the part of engagement because they, my experience is that that they feel understood, that somebody actually is talking about them, though we are talking overall about neurobiology temperament, uh, uh, basically over control. Right. We do a lot. We do a lot uh, during treatment, at the beginning of treatment, part of the engagement. And we do with individual and with the family. Okay, cool. And I, you know, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that, you know, as I'm hearing you talk there, um, built right within the neurobiological model that we have in the treatment itself, you know, we have strong hypotheses that are supported by data yeah. uh, showing that if a person is in a state of starvation, that it actually triggers, um, you know, a part of the brain, the dorsal vagal complex, which you know, creates a, a shutdown response where there's less pain sensitivity. The person doesn't feel pain as much. They, they look like a zombie. They numb out. And so we believe the hypotheses here are that the starvation is often reinforced because it turns off. But when you get in that numb state, it actually turns off your threat sensitivity, your your state of sympathetic nervous system arousal. And so I think it, like what Mima's saying, it's within the model itself, there's lots of ways to understand how a person can get into problems and, and difficulties. And we have, you know, we just integrated into treatment in that way. Um, and at the same time, I might also say though, I mean, some things, I'm, there's a lot of, a big list here. And I guess I'm aware of imagining that whoever asked that, wherever we got the question, they might've been thinking about like specific eating disorders. And they kind of separate out OC from eating disorder issues and, and that type of thing. And, and I, I don't know why I brought that up, even now that I think about it. <laughs> anyway, so Mimo, why don't we Mimo cut that gonna, part out? I just want to say for me, can you, when I'm teaching uh, psychoeducation that, and I teach about temperament, genetics, predisposition, I do that a lot. That's where the treatment kind of starts when uh, in the parents group, in the par when, when even when I'm doing parents group, I do the psychoeducation, which is psychoeducation about over control, really. Uh, mm -hmm. and neurobiology. And one thing that everyone will identify if you ask a young person who is suffering from anorexia, uh, are they feeling emotionally numb? They will relate to that. And kind of yesterday in the parents' uh, group, uh, skill class, the parents said, yes, she went this weekend. She said, I want to be numb again. I have to restrict because I need to be numb again. So... I think we have evidence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, one of the things that I add playfully when I teach a skills class in our residential program, when I'm teaching about the Q states and I explain, you know, so you come to res and we refeed you, we make you eat, and then we make you be vulnerable and you start feeling again. And this is why you freaking hate us. And they always burst out laughing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the very fact that they're laughing might mean they don't hate you so much, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next question then is, um, do you go over the physical impact of eating disorders and other education? For example, the binge purge cycle, general problems of restricting. And if you do, when do you do that? I, I mean, for me, it's, again, higher levels of care, so it's a little different because they're getting that information, like, from day one or day two. Yeah. So it's, you know, I think that would be different in an outpatient basis. Okay. 
in our outpatient basis, it's basically the doctor who does all the physical bits uh, because they do the physical monitoring. So they also do the physical uh, education. We also have pediatrician who does the physical education. Uh, so it, it's the part of it, but it's not the role of our DBT therapist. Right. So here again, we're kind of like seeing how important it is that you have the, the, the multidisciplinary team with you or uh, yeah. somebody working alongside you that, that takes over this part of the treatment. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's important to recognize that that was always built into, it's in the treatment manual and described exactly that way. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why are we answering these questions now, because we've gotten not a lot of feedback, but there's some people that have asked us to address these and, and that's reasonable yeah. to do. And that's why we're actually doing this yeah. question and answer session. Yeah. And I think this. also one of the other differences is that when we were meeting in person to train people, we had the opportunity to answer questions exactly. in person. And now we've got the blended learning webinars. We've lost that opportunity for questions. That's and a really answers. good point. So I think yeah. it's important that we, that we offer something like this in, to, to replace the question and answers that we used I to have. Yeah. yeah. So we've only got a couple of questions left for, for this go round. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of guessing I know what the answers are going to be, but we'll see. So do clinicians teach set point theory and weight science in this model? No. <laughs> I wish I'd put money on that. <laughs> and then I can guess who does do it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay, go on then, Alan, tell us. <laughs> well, it's the multidisciplinary team, right? It's going to be the dietitian or the physician who's doing the medical monitoring. Right. Okay. Anything to add, Mima? No. Nope. <laughs> that was an easy one. Yeah, yeah. It was. Okay, so how does RODBT conceptualize and address body image disturbances in anorexia and BN for client in a larger body? Sure. Uh, kind of the only thing that I, kind of, I worked with the clients who were doing a lot of mirror checking, which is about the main uh, issue. And the problem with the mirror checking went because they've done that in the when there were other people around, I could address that as a social signal. Uh, however, uh, Ellen, you might, I don't think so in any kind of other way. Um, so, I mean, w one way I think to, to kind of approach it is, you know, recognizing the difference between body hatred. Yeah body neutrality, and then actually appreciating and valuing your body for what your body does for you. Um, and honestly, there's a word for it, and I cannot think of it off the top of my head. Um, and so part of eating disorder, eating disorder treatment is helping patients recognize the, you know, the difference between um, I hate my thighs, my thighs are so fat, which is body hatred versus body neutrality, which is I have thighs, versus this appreciation for one's body, which is my thighs are strong and they enable me to take long walks with the people I love. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways, body image is a, a problem probably for the majority of, I was going to say women, but I think that it's a, probably a problem Absolutely. for men as well. I'm not a man. Yes. I don't know. Simply because of the societal expectations that there are on us, um, you know, like to be skinny or slim, to look or young, muscular. Um, muscular and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's a huge question. And I, I don't think it's something that is necessarily just applied to people with anorexia or, yeah. or people in I mean, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Tom, I just wanted to say it has to be brought again to the values, kind of the body image can, uh, and what kind of values you want to live by. If that's stopping uh, yeah. you having the quality of life that you want. Yeah. Uh, preoccupation with body image. Yeah. Yeah, it's maybe another way to just help people recognize that are listening to this. You know, this problem here, it, part of it from an RODBT perspective might be a, an exploration with the client is how is this body image issue that you have interfering with your life? And in what way? How is it interfering with you reaching your value goals? How is it interfering with your relationships? 
And if it really is, in other words, we look, we take it there and we work with the most extreme first. So if it's not impacting relationships or, or the way of living mm -hmm. that acutely at that time, it mm -hmm. might go, might not be something that we're focused on necessarily right away. We might go to other things that we see as other more problematic. It just depends. And I right. think I, that's what I'm hearing from both of you, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, makes sense to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we've got through the questions. So um, we're actually going to be uh, recording a second set of questions, but those uh, that that discussion is going to be more geared towards questions that come up as people are learning RODBT treatment. And so they're more about, you know, how do we put things on the diary card? What might we do about teaching specific skills? So we're asking um, for people to have at least started the level two of the blended learning program um, to be able to register for that. So, so I just want to say thank you. Do you know, I've really enjoyed it. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I just love hearing the experience of Mima and Ellen. It was it was wonderful. Me too. I, I really liked it. And Tom, as usual. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank oh, that's you. sweet. Oh. Um, and I can't wait to see you guys again. You know, it's great. And I just want to thank both of you for being here and really and Erica for yeah. asking yeah. questions and I, th I thought it was a lot of fun as well. Yeah, so it's really, really interesting it. to me. Okay, Thank so you. thanks, guys. Thanks, so everyone. Thank you. Really Thank cool. you. Bye. Okay. okay.